Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a warm welcome. We are deeply honored to introduce our webinar, Organ Donation, Live Beyond, Live Forever. This is a part of CII, IWN, the Indian Women Network's objective to educate the community at large for the need for organ donation, which can help save lives as well as enhance the quality of life for so many of our loved ones. During our lifetime, most of us try to give back to society in some form or the other. So why not continue the good work once we pass on and donate our organs to give someone else the gift of life? Today, we have an eminent panel and I would like to welcome each and every one of you. Firstly, I would like to welcome our special guest, Mr. Baman Irani, who truly needs no introduction. Next, I would like to welcome our panel of esteemed doctors, Dr. Arvinder Soin, Chairman and Chief Surgeon, Medanta Liver Transplant Institute, and Dr. Sandeep Atawar, Program Director and Chair, Kim's Heart and Lung Transplant Institute. I would also like to welcome Ms. Pallavi Kumar, Executive Director, the Mohan Foundation, and our wonderful donor families and recipients, Mr. Anil Ahuja, Mr. Abhide Tiwari, and Ms. Shreya. Thank you all for making this event possible. Finally, I would like to introduce Ms. Bhavna Vedhara, Chairwoman of CII IWN Delhi, whose vision and leadership has steered us to put together this wonderful event. Over to you, Bhavna. Thank you so much, Sia. Thank you so much for that. And let's just get started. Let's dive right into it. Pallavi, Pallavi, can I request you to please uh, start us off and share a little bit about what is organ donation and what is the difference between live and uh, a deceased donor? Thanks, Bhavna. So organ donation in very simple terms is really the donation of, of a human organ or a tissue from a living or a deceased, a dead person, to a living recipient who is in need of some kind of a transplant, some kind of an organ transplant or a tissue transplant. So it's a simple act of this donation. That's what organ donation really is all about. Uh, coming to what is a living donation, living donation, as the name suggests, is donation by a person who's alive. And in this case, uh, what, what can a living person give? A living person can give a kidney because we are all blessed with two kidneys and, and can happily survive with one. And a portion of the liver, because the liver, as Dr. Soin will say, is, is a fascinating organ which can regenerate itself. So a living person can give this these two things uh, most commonly. There's, of course, a portion of pancreas, but that's not so common. Uh, right. For every other organ, you need someone who's not alive, who's, who's died, who does not need those organs anymore. Right. And as a country, how is India doing in terms of organ donation? Like, how do we compare to the rest of the world? Quite bad. I wish I had something nice to say about our country's figures and organ donation, but we are amongst the most poorly performing uh, country um, amongst, amongst the world, you know. So and given the size of our population, I wish we were doing better. But uh, the organ donation rate of a country is measured by the number of people who go on to donate in a million people, in 10 lakh people. We are at an organ donation rate of 0.8 per million population. That means not even a single person in 10 lakh people in our country goes on to become a donor. So that's where we are. And we really, really have a long way to go, Bhavna. We're doing badly. Oh. <laughs> we have improved over the years, but we, 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 we have a long way to go. I agree with you, especially when we look at Europe and some of those countries where it's assumed unless you, you know, exercise a right to refuse. So what really are the organs and tissues that one can donate, like upon your demise? Upon your demise, just about yeah. every organ, every solid organ that you can think about, both the kidneys, the liver, the heart, the lungs, the pancreas, the intestine, you know, where you can do and and. Uh, in when it comes to tissues, you can do donate your cornea, skin, bone, ligaments. And there are multiple tissues that one can, heart walls. So right. um, just about anything that a person could need uh, can be donated by a deceased donor. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much, Pallavi. I'm going to move on to Dr. Soin. Dr. Soin, Pallavi has just mentioned that a living person can donate a kidney and a portion of their liver. And these are uh, two of the most common transplants uh, happening in the country. Is that right? So to, 
<laughs> so that that's that's right, Bhavna. These are the two most common type of transplants that uh, happen in India. Yeah, and Dr. Soin, you have been recognized the world over for pioneering and establishing liver transplantation in India. So a really warm welcome to you. Uh, Thanks. Dr. Soin, what would you say are the three main causes of liver failure? Well, may I say there are four main causes of liver failure among adults. Yeah. Uh, the first and foremost now is something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that happens to patients who have uncontrolled diabetes or whose lipid levels are abnormal. You know, they have dyslipidemia. That means the balance of cholesterol, triglycerides, and other lipids are, is, is spoiled. Hmm. Um, or they're obese. Or they could just inherit some bad genes. Um, so these are the reasons why somebody gets a fatty liver without consumption of alcohol. And yes. at its very extreme, it can actually go on to produce scarring, which is called fibrosis in medical terms. And when the fibrosis stage goes from one to four, that's when cirrhosis sets in. Cirrhosis is yes. not a disease. Cirrhosis is a stage or state of the liver that happens after uh, consistent damage over several years, either from fat in a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or let's say the second cause of, the second commonest cause of liver disease is alcoholic liver disease. Right. That means due to excessive consumption of alcohol. The other uh, two common causes are hepatitis C and hepatitis B. So these are the four top causes of uh, a bad liver. If somebody says I've got chronic liver disease or someone's got chronic liver disease or cirrhosis. It has usually happened because of one of these four causes in about 90% of the cases. And then there are a few rarer causes. And among okay. children, among children, the commonest disease that causes a bad liver or liver cirrhosis is something called biliary atresia. Biliary atresia is a condition in which the bile tree of the liver. You know, one of the main functions of the liver is to secrete bile that helps in digestion of food. Yeah. And that actually gets secreted in a tree-like fashion through branches into a trunk which goes into the intestine. And when those are diseased, then the bile collects in the liver, damages the liver, causes cirrhosis. And that's the cause of cirrhosis in 60% of children less than five. So wow. these are the common causes. In the first uh, type that you just spoke about, which was uh, not related to alcoholism, and the very first one before the, is that genetic? Like I said, a uh, minority uh, of those cases are genetic, but majority are not. Are not, are, oh, okay. No, they are lifestyle diseases. Um, like I said, obesity, dyslipidemia, right. um, uncontrolled diabetes, and so on. Okay. Um, could you also help uh, the audience understand the process of a liver transplant, whether it's from a live donor or uh, from a deceased? Sure. So when typically, how does one get diagnosed with liver disease? You have an ultrasound for a tummy ache or a more serious problem, like let's say jaundice, your, your, you know, the color of your eyes becomes yellow, your you know, the urine becomes yellower than usual. So if these things happen, or if you're just having a check for some other reason or an executive health check or something, and you have an ultrasound and they find that there is abnormal texture, the liver looks abnormal, or it looks cirrhotic. So that's often the way people find out that they have a bad liver disease, right? Right. And, <clears throat> and when patients come to us to seek advice for a bad liver, it's usually for one of the three reasons. One, they've had acute liver disease. They were absolutely well earlier. And in the previous few days or weeks, they've developed uh, you know, a liver uh, inflammation called hepatitis. And that happens due to hepatitis A or B, and that normally recovers in four weeks. So we won't talk about that. The common jaundice, you know, X had jaundice when she was a child and so on. So that's the common jaundice that recovers. Then the second reason is liver cancer. And the okay. third reason is cirrhosis. Cirrhosis, as I told you, is because of one of those four causes and the liver goes to an advanced stage of scarring. And when they come to seek help, for, you know, they, they come to us to seek help for their liver yeah. disease, we assess them 
And if they've got advanced liver disease and there are certain parameters, certain numbers and scoring systems, right. and if they fit into the criteria of advanced liver disease, then we advise them. Then, then, we, we, advise? Advise, then we advise them transplant. Transplants, right. So if they've gone to an advanced stage, according to the scoring systems of the disease, liver disease that you know, we normally practice or normally use, then they are advised transplant. Or if they have liver cancer, stage one, two, or three, but not stage four, then they can also have a liver transplant. Now, once the need for a transplant is uh, ascertained by a liver expert, then we say that you can get a donor uh, either in, on the deceased donor list, or you can get a family person to donate half the liver. Yeah. And they go on the deceased donor list, typically takes about six to 12 months to get a liver if you're on that list. Right. And if they're in a rush or they have a cancer, then they can't wait that long. So we tell them that any person in the family who's 18 to 55 years old is, got, has, has the matching blood group, which means the yeah. same group of blood group O, and is not obese, because if they're obese, they'll have fatty liver. So... Mm -hmm. Any person, 18 to 55, matching group, not obese, within the family, whether it's first degree, second degree, through in-laws or, you know, wife's relatives or your own relatives, they can be a donor. And we assess the suitability of the patient and the donor for about three to four days and the matching and make sure that it's going to be safe for them. And after yeah. the assessment, we then go ahead with a live donor transplant or if they don't have a live donor, if they don't have the urgency to have a live donor transplant, then they go on a uh, a waiting list for a deceased donor organ. Right. Thank I'm you. I'm not going to tell you how I do the surgery. Uh, <laughs> but I can if you're interested. No, thanks. That's fine, Dr. Soin. Thank you so yeah. much. I have one more question for you. You know, we hear that there are far more um, deceased donor transplants happening in the South as compared to the North. Is that, um, is that indeed true? It is true. Uh, south and the West. So, okay. Uh, you know, uh, in, in Tamil Nadu, in, in Andhra Pradesh, in Karnataka, yeah. uh, in Kerala, um, and in Maharashtra, and in Gujarat, the rates are much higher than the rest of the states. But why do you think that is? I think that's uh, primarily because of uh, two reasons. One is that there are uh, champions of organ donation in a lot of the hospitals and there are transplant coordinators. Those are the kind of people who know everything about donation and transplantation. The kind of people that Pallavi's organization uh, trains. Mm. And the other is that usually the government has been very interested in pushing organ donation awareness programs. So right. I don't think people are that different between the South and the North or West and the East. I think it's also, it's, it's, it's a matter of awareness and right. the awareness cannot be spread just by doctors or these programs or NGOs. The government has to be, you know, hugely behind this uh, awareness Enrolled program. in the process. Only, yeah. only if they are deeply invested does this happen. And that's yeah. happening in these states in the South and the West, apart from the hospitals actually having transplant coordinators and set protocols for such donations to happen. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Soin. That was truly uh, informative. And now I would like to introduce uh, someone very, very special, Mr. Anil Ahuja, who took the brave decision to donate a loved one's organs, not once, but twice. A few years ago, he donated his mother's corneas. And this year on Holi, he donated the organs of his sister to save multiple lives. Uh, Anilji, a warm welcome to you, really. Good evening. Can you please unmute yourself, Anilji? Thank you, Bhavna. Thank you for having me here for this such a lead panel and giving me an opportunity to speak my mind. I'm very happy to be <laughs> here and to share my views on this. Thank you so much for joining us. So Anilji, can I uh, ask you what motivated you to take this very brave uh, decision? And also was there, uh, was the entire family in agreement or was there a difference of opinion amongst yourselves? Oh, it's a very good question, Bhavna. Uh, yes, we were aligned. What happened, I, I mean, I like to tell you the past, how it happened. Five years ago when I lost my mom, so the force behind this motivation is my eldest brother named Ashoka Uja. I like to share my family. We are three brothers. Uh, the Ashoka Uja, the eldest, lives here in Delhi, and the elder to me lives in US, settled in US, and I'm the youngest one. 
when we lost my mother my brother uh, the eldest brother i'm talking about he has been working very for the such people he has donated himself blood for more than 120 times and wow. my bhabhi probably my bhabhi probably more than 80 times they have been working on for such causes in fact when my mother died he immediately my mother was with me at that time and my brother said anil this my mom's body has to be donated which probably it was a, i was not at all agree for that it was a very very difficult decision for me and i was little scared that the body will get mutilated how it will happen and i put my foot down no 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 it won't happen obviously like any other son i was also attached to my mom and she was staying with me so it was very difficult for me at that time but somehow right. my brother my brother convinced me and then he said anil at least we have to give the eyes which mm-hmm. i agreed and then i saw the procedure this uh, from sharaf eye center they came within 10 minutes they did the procedure and the doubt which was there in my mind the body get mutilated the blood comes out it was all over it was it, it was such a easy process which was done and later on when i realized it i mean and after doing this there was no problem no no tension which came which you were little, when you were in such a mood such emotional stage difficult stage when somebody has gone then i saw this has happened and after that i came came to know that few people at least minimum two people can this eyes can be used and uh, this was a wonderful thing my mom went and then gave eyes to two people then once right. it happened then we started thinking on the organ also then i started learning about it this is how we all got motivated and this year very unfortunately right. when we lost our sister then probably it was not a very difficult decision for us to do because we had prepared ourselves for such things so how old was your sister when she uh, passed on she was 56 and what were the circumstances around her passing oh she fell at home and when she fell at home in the night uh, it was a day before holi we took her to the hospital and next morning akash hospital and we we went there uh, we came to know in the morning that her brain is dead and since as i said uh, we ha- we had some knowledge and we in the family we had understood the need for all this and we were really motivated <clears throat> then we realized that okay this is something time to pay back to the society i immediate my brother and we immediately took a decision that probably we have to talk about the organ donation and we spoke to the doctor that this is how we would like to go about it and uh, yes the hospital's uh, doctors helped us they right. made us to fulfill the need what we thought and the wishes of my sister and the family thank you so much anil ji and in fact you shared even that um, that the the five different you'd had two corneas and two kidneys and a liver right yeah exactly 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 yeah. i think you're very brave as a family um so how important would you say are the conversations amongst family members because you know i mean after all the person can have an intention to donate but if the family you know uh, is it important to have the buy in from everyone what do you feel no it is very very important look uh, in my family and at least i keep on telling people sharing like i tell you my, my two children my son lives in us and daughter settled in delhi along with with us my wife and within our family brothers and all we keep on discussing the need for this cause and i am sure my my son and my daughter and my family they are aware of it because the one who is gone he doesn't know what is happening the yeah. important is the people left behind they should be there to take action like what we did for our sister so this is very very important and at least i can say with all pride that at least my family knows my children know that what is what should be done who is going to go first nobody knows but whoever goes first the next one has to take care that we have to think on those lines and whatever can be sorted out whatever can be donated we should come forward anil ji you are <laughs> i i really am um, so grateful to you for sharing your story you're truly truly inspirational and you know your family obviously has a culture of giving and there is a lot to learn from families such as yours thank you no, so much uh, for sharing your uh, story thank thank you but all credit goes to my eldest brother mr ashok ahuja and my brother who lives in uh, usa they have been motivating us and this is all goes to them thank you for that. thank you so much uh quickly i just want to bring in pallavi pallavi um from the time that a family decides to donate um you know from the time that they receive the news that okay now their loved one is uh you know not going to make it or whatever or brain uh brain dead they have to be so then at that point um who bears the cost of keeping the deceased on a ventilator until the organs are harvested and the body is handed back to the family good question bhavna uh, so there is of course indeed a lot of cost that is incurred on the potential uh, organ donor uh, even though he has been declared dead till the time the organs are harvested mm-hmm. and as per the law that governs all the work that we are doing uh, all the work right. in the area it says mm-hmm. that the moment the donor families says 
yes to organ donation, their billing has to stop. Okay. And all the subsequent expenditure has to be borne either by the hospital or by the recipients. It's something that the hospital has to decide. Very often the hospital covers it, um, you know, but, but the billing for the donor family stops the moment the family says yes to organ donation. And very quickly, Bhavna, I, I recently had the opportunity to speak at the Akash Hospital, Anil Ahujaji's family. It was their first donation for the hospital. And I spoke to the senior doctors that called me to speak on organ donation. And the whole team was so enthused to set up an organ donation program in place. And it's all thanks to families like Ahujaji. So hats off and salute to them. Absolutely, Pallavi, so well said. Um, um, Ahuja ji, it's really, uh, you know, entire um, Anil ji's family, really hats off to you. So much to learn. At this point, I want to invite Mr. Baman Irani, a very, very special guest joining us all the way from Budapest. Baman, a warm welcome to you. You'll have to unmute yourself, but I'm still introducing. <laughs> I don't think Baman needs any introduction but I doubt there will be a single person in the audience who hasn't loved the adorable doctor from Munna Bhai MBBS and Virus from Three Idiots. You are truly known for infusing life into each character that you have played over the years and made into a household name. Baman is also a very popular motivational speaker amongst many other things that he does. And most importantly though, he is a very great human being. It cannot be a sheer coincidence that you should be here with us today, motivating people to infuse life into others after they have passed on. So Baman, can I request you to tell us, share with us what inspired you to get involved in this cause? Okay, first of all, I really don't know how I made it to this uh, wonderful panel of highly educated uh, uh, people. Uh, maybe because, you know, the power of cinema so someone must have seen a movie where I played a doctor and here I am on, on a panel full of these wonderful, <laughs> wonderful <laughs> people. So excuse me and I beg your pardon. Uh, here I am. But yeah, I am motivated. It must have started uh, some 10, 10 to 15 years ago when a cousin of mine had passed and he passed very young. And uh, so my, my cousin's wife, um, she was distraught and she was not making sense at all. Uh, by the time we, you know, we did we brought the body and, and, you know, it, it is a terrible time. And in the middle of all that, my cousin, uh, the sister, the, 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 the wife, she suddenly came out of her, pardon my using the word, her hysteria, and she stopped. Hmm. And she said, hold it right there. And she said, uh, you want to donate his eyes? I said, wow. wow. And I said, okay. Now, we've been spending two to three hours pacifying her. And suddenly out of the blue, humanity hit her in such a beautiful way. And the hysteria stopped. Everything stopped. Everyone calmed down. Reversed the, the car. And took, uh, took, took my, uh, him to... Uh, Dr. Natarajan's Aditya Jyot got it done and she calmed down. And that, that, that's a great emotional lesson for all of us to learn. Um, recently, recently uh, I, I spoke to a, a doctor who, who said, I'd like you to meet this wonderful young girl, a recipient uh, called Monica More. I don't know if you've heard of uh, the case of Monica Mori. She fell out of a train and lost both her hands, arms, hands. And um, so I, I went onto a Zoom call at that the first time round, and uh, I spoke to her. And I was teaching at that point of time on a Zoom call, and I, I, they had 150 uh, students with me, and I, I teach screenwriting. And I said, I'd like you all to wish Monica Mori the very best. And then Monica Mori spoke, and everybody started crying. And I said, it's so wonderful. And the, the donor was from Chennai, and she's from Bombay, Mumbai. And the donor was a male. And the donor was a male. And the doctors were telling me how it was all touch and go during the pandemic, and you know how they got the plane and operation, literally and figuratively also, and metaphorically. Uh, and they got the hand, and 
there she is with these and, and don't get me wrong these male hands right big male hands in in proportion not quite in proportion to the rest of this very very lovely young lady who uh, i'm so fond of now and then she came back to the hospital and the doctor from the hospital who i become very friendly with because i used to call up the, the hospital every time some covid patients would be going home uh, you know send a message and you know the, the staff feels very happy and i think that's our duty as as nakli fake doctors at least that's the least we can do as actors you know what i mean uh, and just send a message and say you know good to good to have you home and then monica more was there and i said can i come and i went to meet monica more and and i saw in front of my very eyes and pardon me if i get a little emotional about this uh, i saw a miracle i saw a miracle in front of my very eyes i know for people from the medical fraternity it, it's their job and they too must be feeling emotional uh, don't get me wrong but getting emotional uh, at at what they do as a miraculous people themselves yeah but i saw this miracle i saw her arms and she was holding her own glass and she was taking it to her to her mouth and drinking water herself this is a few months after that the first time i i spoke to her over the zoom call mm. and then i noticed her hands and and she, i held her hands and then i gave her a pen of course because this the doctor said the day that this happens it means again little feel me sorry about that sorry about that but i gave her a pen and i noticed her hands and the miracle that happened for me was the hands became feminine they became like hers the color changed the hair had fallen off the cuticles were growing the nails were, and i and i said my god this is nature and there is science and then there is the medi- then there is the medical fraternity and i got emotional and of course i broke down and it was so beautiful and and what not but the point i'm trying to make here is there is there is the medical fraternity who is doing their best to ha- make these miracles of nature happen and then there is us the people who should facilitate and inspire people to do what so many brave people do donate and take decisions about the family whether it would be okay with them to donate organs in which of a form or part of the body the organ can be because it's so so beautiful and monica more is smiling again i don't know what her the four or five years how she may have spent without those hands of her and then there is another little story i'd like to to end with if i may do i have a couple of minutes more you can yeah. bomb and we'll give it to you <laughs> yeah uh there's this one very real real pardon my french idiot of a man a real idiot of a man so you got to tell both sides of the story right some brazilian millionaire okay shameful human being who had a million dollar bentley or some some such car and uh, he decided to 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 bury it because he did not want anyone else to own it so he takes this car he puts it on the press and the press goes wild and it becomes national news and the whole press the, from all over the world start focusing their cameras on this brazilian uh genius idiot genius yeah and he dug a grave for the car and he lowered the car into the grave and then he said okay stop i'm not doing it and everybody said you know you should not be doing this because you should be donating that money sell the car and donate it and donate that money to charity he said no such thing and he lowered the car into the grave and then something must have happened the genius that he was he stopped he said pull the car out again he says i was only doing this to prove a point my dear friends to the rest of the world you are all so hysterical and you are calling me selfish selfish for burying a car what about you when you allow people to be buried 
with possessions that are far more priceless than a car. So I was just making a point. What is the point of burying human beings if you cannot use those beautiful parts to create miracles? And that is one hell of a moving story. So my job here, I understand nothing of, I was trying very hard to follow what Dr. Soin was saying, pardon me, I nodded my head a few times as if I'm in the know, Dr. Soin, but, <laughs> but the only thing I know is reacting to, to, to human kindness, like, your, like people like you, your human kindness is unparalleled. And I urge people, I urge people, as the gentleman before me spoke, where he said that it, 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 was, it, was, it was painless. Of course it's painless. It's only painful for the people who are left behind. But, yeah. it, but it, it is something that one must do. One must spread the word. And I can't thank you all enough for doing what you're doing. So you're asking me, why am I involved? I think I've given you a few <laughs> reasons. So, you have really, uh... so, so thank you for doing what you're doing. And, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Raman, and thank you so much for sharing, um, you know, everything that moved you and touched you. And it's, it's so true what you said. Uh, you know, we all, we need to think about why are we burying those? And um, thank you so much. That was really inspiring. And, you know, and you're, you talked about Monica. We have our own dear Shreya with us today. She is a truly delightful, courageous and inspiring, absolutely inspiring young lady. A warm welcome to you, Shreya. Can I say hello to Shreya? Yes, you Before may. Before everybody else does. Hey, Shreya. <laughs> turn on, your, turn oh. on your... She's also had a bilateral yeah. hand transplant, uh, Baman. So please, can we unmute wow. Shreya? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Hello, hello. Thank you so much. Bhavna. She's unmuted. Shreya. Hi. Yeah. Big, the big virtual jadu ki jabdi for you, my dear. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's, that's very sweet of you. <laughs> A warm welcome to you, Shreya. So, Shreya, yeah. you underwent a bilateral hand transplant a couple of years ago. Please, yeah. can I request you to share with us what were the circumstances that actually led up to um, that led up to you requiring uh, this kind of bilateral hand transplant? Yeah. Uh, so this was in 2016. Uh, I was an 18-year-old uh, girl, like anyone else. I was uh, pursuing my engineering uh, at Manipal Institute of Technology in Karnataka. So after my midterm exams, I had come home uh, for a one-week vacation. Uh, and my home is in Pune. Uh, so after spending a week with my parents, uh, I was uh, going back to my college. Uh, it's an overnight bus journey from here to Manipal. Uh, at around 5 a.m. in the morning, the driver dozed off uh, and he lost control over the bus. So the bus overturned uh, and it was dragged for around 100 meters or so. Uh, so, uh, you know, during this uh, accident, uh, both my forearms were completely crushed. Uh, and uh, from there, I was uh, taken to the Manipal hospital. Uh, well, uh, doctors tried their best uh, to save uh, uh, at least one hand, uh, but they couldn't because uh, the damage was way too much. So uh, both my arms, they had to be amputated. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I wasn't uh, really aware as to what all was uh, going on. Uh, I did know that uh, something is terribly wrong, but uh, I was still in the ICU and uh, my parents told me that uh, both my forearms had to be amputated because uh, the damage was severe. And... Uh, of course, uh, I did not know what to say or how to react, uh, but my parents, they assured me that uh, they will support me in uh, every way possible. Uh, so eventually, after getting out of the hospital, uh, after uh, you know Googling for uh, what would be the life uh, after uh, bilateral amputation, I got to know that there were just two options. Uh, one would be going for the uh, prosthetic hands or uh, artificial limbs. Uh, and the uh, second one was hand transplant, which was uh, fairly new, uh, but uh, there had been three successful cases by then uh, in India. So uh, that was when we were contemplating between these two options. So, okay, you knew your hands uh, had been hurt. You had sustained other injuries as well. Yeah. And you were, um, so, okay. And from the time you lost your hands due to the accident until the time that you received 
uh, yeah. these hands. What did that waiting mean for you? Uh, well, I, uh, I was uh, without forearms for about one year. So uh, during that time, uh, for the, I mean, the first three months, they were, they were bad. Uh, because I had sustained other injuries and uh, for, for, for the first two months or so I was bedridden. So uh, I needed my parents to, you know, get me out of the bed. Uh, it was uh, that bad. And uh, eventually I started making progress. Uh, the other injuries, they healed. Uh, I was better that way. Uh, and uh, when the injuries on my stumps, I mean, whatever part of my arms were left when they healed, uh, so I, I decided to try out the uh, prosthetic hands because a hand transplant is a permanent solution. But right. uh, before that, I wanted to see how prosthesis would work out. Uh, so I did try uh, two types of prosthetic hands. Uh, one was the mechanical and the other one was the electronic hands. Mm -hmm. uh, none of the two options worked for me uh, because uh, the issue with uh, prosthetic hands is that you cannot put them in water. And as a bilateral amputee, I wanted uh, to be independent when it came to personal hygiene related activities. And Absolutely. most of those activities in India, they are water based. So uh, despite having prosthetic hands, I was constantly dependent on my mother uh, for the most basic activities. Uh, and I did not want to live that kind of life. So uh, that is when, uh, you know, hand transplant, you know, it became my hope that uh, I can be independent again. I wouldn't have to depend on my mom for uh, the <laughs> most basic activities. You are a very, very brave uh, person. And I, I really, hats off to you, uh, Shreya, really. Um, can you share with us what you felt when you met the donor's family? Uh, yeah, so uh, my... Uh, Transplant happened in August 2017. Uh, so at that point, I was still the fourth one in the entire country. Uh, and uh, I suppose it was one of a kind because uh, I was the first female to receive male hands. So uh, this hadn't been carried out. So, and uh, also, I mean, uh, the donor's family, they did know they have donated their son's hands. So uh, we did get to know uh, that who they were exactly. And uh, about four months post my transplant, uh, uh, I was lucky enough to uh, meet them. Yeah. And uh, uh, so uh, I've met uh, my donor's parents. Uh, <clears throat> when I met them for the first time, uh, uh, his father told me that uh, they have donated most of their son's organs uh, willingly and wholeheartedly. How uh, old was he? How old was he? Can you just So I was him? 19 and he was 19 as well. You were 19 when your accident happened, Shreya? No, when my transplant happened. And uh, yeah, and my donor was 19 as well. Okay, so he was also, so, I mean, very young. Yes, yes. So, uh, you, you know, his father told me that uh, we could donate most of his organs, but uh, there was some issue uh, with the heart donation. They had to airlift it and that couldn't be carried out. So he said my son's heart was, uh, it was young and a strong heart. And, uh, you know, unfortunately it couldn't be donated. I don't know how many people can, uh, you know, say that after losing their young son. So, yeah. It to was deal with uh, that grief. very brave of them. <sighs> to deal with that grief and, um, and to be able to say that. Anyway, uh, you are truly amazing an inspiring story and the fact is that we are all human and one never knows at which point in our lives we may end up requiring a life-saving transplant ourselves give me a minute please can i have a tissue <laughs> it's been very uh, moving for me as well shreya every time i speak to you i still i'm so sorry but uh Okay, thank you so much, Shreya. And now I would like to bring on Abhishek Ji. Abhishek Ji, he has uh, received the gift of sight. Can we please have Abhishek Ji here with us? Hello? Anji Abhishek Ji? Uh, uh, Aapki 
हेलो 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 अभिषेक जी हाँ मैम आपकी कैन वी सी हिज वीडियो प्लीज कैन वी टर्न इट ऑन फॉर हिम वीडियो ऑन है is his picture visible to everyone abhishek ji ah uh, yes ma'am aap apna camera aur um, usko mute unmute uh, apne aap ko well you are unmuted but um, aapka camera nahi dikhai de raha hai aapki shakal nahi aa rahi hai abari No, we can't really see him. Um, let's just hear him, Abhishek ji. आप हमें बता सकते हैं कि आपको क्या हुआ था जिसके कारण आपको दिखाई देना बंद हो गया हाँ ये डिशीज लगभग ट्वेल्व ईयर्स की उम्र में शुरू हुई डॉक्टर्स ने बताया कि ये बीमारी जेनेटिक है राइट ये बीमारी हमारे परिवार में दो सिस्टर्स हैं हमारी जो बड़ी हैं उनको भी है जब हम ट्वेंटी वन ईयर्स की एज में थे जब आते आते ये बीमारी बहुत बढ़ गई थी राइट right. जब हमने बीएससी कंप्लीट करी उस टाइम पर कंप्लीट करने के बाद उसको ड्रॉप करना पड़ा पढ़ाई को जी क्योंकि रोशनी पूरी तरह चली गई और दूसरों पर डिपेंड हो गए थे तो इस समय आपकी उम्र क्या थी उस समय हमारी उम्र थी लगभग ट्वेल्व ईयर्स सॉरी से दर अगेन ट्वेंटी ईयर्स हाँ ट्वेंटी वन ईयर्स ट्वेंटी वन ईयर्स राइट सो ट्वेंटी वन ईयर्स से फिर आप कम्प्लीटली uh, औरों पे डिपेंडेंट हो गए हाँ पूरी तरह से डिपेंड हो गए थे राइट right. एंड uh, फिर आपको uh, किस किस उम्र पे जाके ये कॉर्नियाज मिले थे इसके लिए करीब बारह साल को अभी हम परेशान रहे आई साइट लगभग जीरो परसेंट हो गई थी दूसरों के भरोसे टॉयलेट जाने के लिए भी जरूरत पड़ती थी दूसरों पर डिपेंड हो गए थे और ये परेशानी इतनी बढ़ गई कि आमदनी कोई इसकी नहीं पापा की कमाई से ही घर चलता था राइट right. तो ये हमें कॉर्निया लगभग गुड़गांव में निरामय से पता चला कि यहाँ कॉर्निया जानकारी मिली जी आ, ये चल पता चला करीब थर्टी थ्री इयर्स ओल्ड थे तो आपको थर्टी थ्री पे कॉर्निया मिला कॉर्निया मिला राइट तो उस समय एक मिला था हाँ एक मिला था जी और फिर आपको दूसरा भी मिला था ना आपने बताया था दूसरा हमें मिला करीब जब हम थे थर्टी सिक्स ईयर ओल्ड ओके सो तीन साल का बीच uh, में फर्क डिफरेंस था राइट right. तो, तो ये हमारा डॉक्टर हितेंद्र राहुल जन ने ऑपरेशन किया जिससे कि हमारा जो लाइफ है पूरी तरह चेंज हो गई और इसके बाद हमारी गवर्नमेंट जॉब भी लग गई है ठीक है तो आप हमें बता सकते हैं कि आपको कॉर्निया मिलने के बाद आ, कैसे लगा क्या, क्या आपकी जिंदगी कैसे बदली हाँ कॉर्निया से बिल्कुल जीवन बिल्कुल नया हो गया था और ऑपरेशन होने के बाद गवर्नमेंट जॉब लग गई है हमारी आज हम टीचर हैं गवर्नमेंट स्कूल में और मेरी शादी भी हो गई है और वन इयर्स का एक बेबी बेटा भी है बहुत बढ़िया तो आप आपको तो नया जीवन मिल गया है हाँ पूरी तरह से जीवन चेंज हो गया है और नया जीवन मिल गया है बहुत बढ़िया बहुत बहुत अच्छा रियली बामन आई नो दैट यू हैव टू लीव सो बामन कैन यू से समथिंग फॉर ऑल आवर व्यूअर्स बिफोर यू हैड आउट बामन यू आर म्यूटेड Please unmute yourself. I, I scold everyone. Yeah, there I am. Here I am. Yeah. First of all, a big first of all, a uh, big apology. I'm sitting in a little van over here in the outskirts of Budapest doing some filming. So, and I I taken an hour off, and uh, they're they're knocking on my door very politely, 
and calling me. So I, I apologize. I apologize for leaving, but hearing these inspirational stories, you know, it gives me, it gives us all so much more impetus to spread the word. I think that's what's happening now. The medical fraternity is all geared up. They're doing their, what they have to do, but I think it's all got to do with a cheap word called supply. And I think let's do this. Let's do this as best as we can uh, as, as human beings, as a community, as a community of people who, who love our fellow human beings, no matter what, what race, color, age, sex, anything. Uh, so thank you all. God bless you all to the fraternity and thank you for having me. I'm truly humbled. Thank you, all of you. Thank, thank you, you bye so bye. much, Baman. Thank you so much. Thanks for being with us. Um, okay, and now we have Dr. Atawar, uh, who is a renowned heart and lung transplant surgeon based out of Hyderabad. Uh, Dr. Atawar's center is the largest lung transplant program in Asia. Dr. Atawar and his team have currently, during this whole COVID crisis, performed 25 lung transplant surgeries on patients suffering from and uh, end stage COVID damaged lungs. Dr. Atavar, a very warm welcome to you. So, Thank Doc, you so much. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, Doc, you do both heart and lung transplants. Mm -hmm. Could you please share with us what the circumstances um, uh, are by which someone may end up requiring a heart or a lung transplant? So thank you once again. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the heart is an amazing organ. And uh, it's, it's quite fascinating to believe that it just not pumps oxygen, nutrient-rich blood throughout the body, to be able to sustain life. But this fist-shaped organ, which is a powerhouse, expands and contracts nearly 100,000 times a day. It pumps five liters of blood every minute. It pumps six and a half thousand liters a day and 2.5 million liters a year. That is 150 million liters in a lifetime. That is more than a billion beats. And all of us are completely unaware of this organ that's sitting in your chest and doing all this efficiently. So every single organ of your body can continue to function well. Yeah. Now, there are some congenital conditions like probably inoperable heart defects, uh, advanced valvular heart disease, probably diseases of the heart muscle that are either metabolic, congenital, nutritional, or a consequence of bad lifestyle. And when you call lifestyle, you talk about diabetes, hypertension, obesity, cholesterol deposition, all of these can cause irreparable damage to the organ, that is the heart per se, progressively making it lose its efficiency over time. Now, many of these diseases could be managed medically, and that's how medical science continues to improve at a rapid pace. So we can keep many of these sick recipients or patients alive for quite a long time. But it is only when all of these life-extending medications or enhancing medications, devices such as pacemakers, and all these other mechanical implements or options that stop working and heart failure truly sets in to create a great deal of ravage on the human body that you have to look for an option like a human heart as a replacement for a damaged one. Now, this replacement sometimes could be a mechanical implement, which you call a left ventricular assist device or an artificial heart. But normally that, that is an expensive and an extremely difficult resource to get by in a country like ours. So it's yeah. only a human heart that could probably be the most viable, most sensible, most easily available opportunity. But it has to come from a resource that has to be a brain dead or a deceased donor who's, right. who or whose family is willing to make that, that sacrifice. So this can be a life-changing decision for most of us. So when you're talking about the lung, likewise, the lung, as we all know, keeps filtering uh, the air that we breathe. It pulls in oxygen. We exhale carbon dioxide. But over a period of time, there are many diseases that again could be either congenital or acquired like smoking or something that we know of now very recently, COVID, which causes life-threatening damage to the lungs, makes right. patients dependent on oxygen, bed-bound, hospitalized, ventilator, ECMO, so on and so forth. You also have pollution to a great extent that causes extensive lung damage. You have diseases called interstitial lung disease that could lead to progressive damage and reduction in lung function thereby significantly hampering not just the quality of life, but it could cause serious mental and physical damage to patients leading to heavy levels of deconditioning. So when you become oxygen dependent to a certain degree, or you probably have a racking continuous cough that prevents you from even sleeping well, yeah. consuming any food, ambulating, that is probably exactly the time when 
your doctors would tell you that you've run out of options and you now probably need a life-changing lung or a heart transplant. And this probably is just a background about how we look at it and how patients present to us. I hope that answers your question largely. It does, Doc. Um, but, you know, in the case, I mean, both Pallavi and Dr. Swine have uh, spoken to us about live donors. In your case, it seems that it's only made possible by, you know, uh, deceased donors, right? So Absolutely. what kind of um, So what kind of challenges does that pose for you? So uh, there, there are many challenges that, you know, that we have to come by. And generally in the course of what we do, uh, as Dr. Swine mentioned earlier, we see patients much later in the course of their illness. And the reasons for them are numerous. You know, the, the first most important thing is the awareness that an organ transplant could be an option, has to come not just from the physician who's treating you, but also has got to come from the patient and their family's viewpoint. So most of them are generally unaware of these options especially when they have end-stage disease. The other is the acceptance of a major and a risky procedure. The third would probably be, obviously, family support. You know, you saw this young child who lost her arms, Shreya, and she now has, she's spoken at length about the extent of family support that she received. Uh, in, a, in a country like ours, affordability is a, is a major issue. You know, when you pay out of your pocket, affordability is certainly a, is a major question. And organ transplantation isn't a cheap, procedure to go through or even to sustain yourself in the long term. But the most important thing, like even Mr. Irani mentioned, and all of us have been waxing about, is the timely availability of a suitable donor organ of great quality. And in numbers that would at least be able to fill the demand supply equation, where in a country like India, we need anywhere between 2 lakh to 6 lakh hearts and lungs annually for the amount of patients who are suffering from end-stage heart and lung disease. Now, when you're looking at most of these patients, now from the patient perspective, this was probably the societal view, but from the patient perspective, you're looking at somebody who already has a failing primary organ mm -hmm. and has secondary organ damage. So when you have a weak heart, you obviously have a weaker liver, you have yeah. a weaker, weaker kidney. Uh, fortunately, many of these uh, uh, weakening, weakening secondary organs are reversible in their nature. So when you have a good functioning lung or a heart in place, Yes, some of this uh, uh, recovery can happen organically and naturally. But most of these patient, patients, unfortunately, because of their long-standing disease condition, are not just malnourished, but some of them are extremely obese, largely because of fluid accumulation when you have heart failure, or probably the excessive use of steroid and medications that you are subject to when you have end-stage lung disease or medication overviews for that matter. So right. they have a lot of physical limitations, even with day-to-day -day activities like getting out of bed, or probably using the washroom become an onerous task for most of them. You know, these Thanks. patients are depressed. They're worried. They, they, yeah. they care about their family. They're oxygen dependent, bed bound. So you need a lot of speed in your team and efficiency to be able to prep them, not just mentally, but working backwards to get them nutritionally prepared, improve right. physical condition, their mental well-being, and keep them in the best possible shape and hope that you get a donor organ on time. And That's this can true. only happen... If you have a team that works very closely, a very close-knit, monitor the patients well, speak to them very frequently, supervise their care, and then pay the utmost attention to the details that go into preparing them well before transplant in a 360-degree fashion. And the you touched upon it. You said transplant is the ultimate example of teamwork. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Atawar. I know we're very short on time, so I'm, I'm going to now um, bring in Mr. Pranav Munjal, who underwent a bilateral lung transplant. Uh, in fact, I think it was Dr. Atawar's team who performed the transplant. So thank you for joining us, Pranav. Yeah, thank you so much, ma'am. So Pranav, can you please share with us uh, what were the circumstances that led uh, up to you needing a lung transplant? Uh, actually, it was all because of a post-COVID effect. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a patient of a attack of a second COVID wave, initially starting when it started. So I was a post-COVID lung fibrosis patient, and I okay. had to go a uh, bilateral lung transplant at King's Hospital. Earlier, in the initial days, I was admitted to a local hospital in Ludhiana, and uh, then the condition worsened, and uh, I was airlifted to Kim's Hospital under the supervision of Dr. Sandeep Batawar and his team. So this is all how it began with. Right. And you said your age is 30. Yeah. So as a 30-year-old, what has this, uh, you know, meant for you? Uh, that's a 
big question because uh, when the whole family was, was uh, ready for my first kid i was fighting for my own life on the death bed but it's just because of the donor and his family and uh, dr sandeep atawar that uh, made it possible for me to reunite with my family and uh, i am fortunate that i am blessed with a daughter girl i named her tanisha i carried her in my arms after two and a half months after my operation and that is really a big big uh, I don't know like i don't have any words actually for all my dear you would say with dr sandeep or or the donor and his family so what would you like your message for our audience today to be oh well there are a number of messages actually a total stranger coming in your life out of nowhere and uh, helping you with all he has just give life to a part of your organ part of your body it's an immense thing it's been a short span of 4.5 months only right now yeah and uh, i am no more feeling a transplant patient right now i'm just a transplant recipient now and it means a lot to me and it gives me a reason to live and uh, live something you know to a greater extent in the coming years to come and i urge every individual to who is listening to us right now to come forward in this organ donation drive and uh, if a donor can save me and many other lives you too can absolutely thank you so much prana uh, just very quickly i'm going to jump to palvi palvi how does one go about the process of becoming an organ donor you decide to become one you decide to become informed and you you decide to do it so india is is an opt in country you mentioned earlier in your uh, somewhere you mentioned about countries that are opt out where everybody is considered a donor unless yeah. they opt out of the system on the other hand india is a country that where no one is considered a donor unless you consciously and voluntarily opt into it so you sure. sign what is called you you pledge to be an organ donor you sign a donor card you could you could go on any of the multiple um, uh, sites of ngos or hospitals and sign up there is a national registry called noto na right. uh, national organ tissue transplant organization you can sign up with mohan foundation ultimately the effort is that all the data is uh, going to go join up into the national registry uh, the mohan foundation website is mohanfoundation.org it's a simple step but what is really far more important bhavna uh, than pledging and signing is this discussion with your family yeah. you know that is really the crux of uh, uh, this whole work because it's a family in our country who will take the final decision whether they want to donate the organs of their loved one or not so even if you've signed in your lifetime the family can veto that decision though i would like to believe families won't do that but this discussion with the family is really really what i would urge each one here you know to 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 go back and do that you know so thank you pallavi coming back to you dr soin what is one thing more than anything else uh that being a transplant surgeon has taught you uh and what is the message you'd like to send out today that's a new and you're mu- uh, you're muted yeah doc. yeah i know i know so uh, <laughs> there's a long list of things i've learned that i've learned uh being a transplant surgeon so i think that uh, one is that's already been talked about that steam work and no not a single transplant happens because of one person it happens first and foremost because of a donor and only then the doctors come into play and then of course it's not one doctor it's it's the anesthetists the surgeons the physicians you know even the nursing staff the dietitians the physiotherapists and so on so everybody plays a very important role and um the other thing is that you know you have to you have to understand the patient's uh, side of the story when you actually you can't be so what transplantation is got to be is actually that these are mostly patients who are nearly dead or very seriously ill and like you've heard in the three or four accounts we've had today they pretty much lost not just everything that we call normalcy but they also lost the will to live yeah. so i think that you have to understand that side of the story before you even dream of making it like mechanical you can't just be a surgeon going in for a surgery and coming out and, you know that it's not like it's never like that so you have to spend time with the family much more than any other kind of surgery 
And then, and then once the life, once the lives change, you see the difference. Oh. That you point at that and say, "That's why I do what I do." Wow, that is really, really touching, Doctor Soing. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Atawa, the same question I'd like to ask you. Being a transplant surgeon, um, you know, what has it taught you and what's the message you would like to send out today? Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll probably uh, add to what Dr. Swain just mentioned. I think what it taught me other than teamwork, it taught me humility and it made me understand how critically ill patients rely on a team's efficiency and how a team must push itself relentlessly towards greater and better caring and be untiring in what they do. So I think that's that's probably what I have learned, and that's what I keep encouraging my colleagues to to uh, absorb. But there's a fundable fundamental premise that brings us here today, and there are two statements that I would like to probably uh, say today. The first is, and both of them are quotes. The first being that there's only one thing that we know about a donor: no matter what they did when they were here on Earth, they died a hero. They saved many lives, and that's a debt that recipients and families can never repay. The other important uh, message that I would like to share with you is, and this is very touching, we are all pieces of a puzzle for someone else's life. You may never know where you fit, but others will fill holes in their lives with pieces of you. Thank you very much. That is, that is so beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to open. I know time is short. Um, is it okay if we take a few questions? Dr. Soin, Dr. Atavar, Pallavi, would it be okay with you sure. to take a few questions? Okay. So Dr. Soin, the first question is for you from mm. Pooja. For a patient suffering from liver cirrhosis, is it possible to remove the cirrhotic part of the liver considering that the liver regenerates itself? The answer is no. Uh, cirrhosis actually affects the entire liver. So it's a generalized disease. It's not specific to a region of the liver that you can remove and uh, the rest of it will be normal. So no, when the cirrhosis gets bad enough, you just have to change the entire liver. So in a cirrhotic liver, we remove the complete uh, liver and replace it with a, uh, with a healthy organ. Okay, Dr. Soin, I have a second question for you also uh, from Swati and uh, Nandini and others. If someone has had a HIV infection or uh, Hep B positive, COVID, thyroid, they were under whatever situations, organ recipients, um, can can they not donate or can they donate? And um, and if so, you know what? Uh, I mean, what organs could be used in these kinds of situations? What do you right? Think? Okay. Um, let's first talk about hepatitis B. Hepatitis B and hepatitis C positive patients who have had treatment for their disease and they no longer actually have the active virus multiplying in them and their liver is normal, the other organs are normal. Yes, they can be donors, but generally these organs would go to hepatitis, the B donor organ will go to hepatitis B patients and C will go to C patients. But in emergency situations, they've actually been used for non-hepatitis patients as well. And the same goes for HIV. Generally, these are not considered as donors. But in an emergency situation, if there is no uh, you know, AIDS syndrome and their CD4 counts are good, then occasionally these organs have been anecdotally used, but they're not good donors. So the answer for HIV is no, but the answer for hepatitis B and C, selectively, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Atawar, we've got from Gunita. A friend had a lung mass that was cancerous. Uh, it's been operated and uh, she's doing well. Uh, she wants to know if she can donate her lungs and other organs. Probably depends upon the grade of the tumor and the type of malignancy that she's had. In all possibility, it must have been a benign tumor. But given the fact that this is already a, considered a marginal donor uh, per se, probably teams would be reluctant to utilize this organ, given the fact that there's always a possibility of a recurrence of either a benign or a malignancy in a donor organ. So my answer would be no. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Atawar. Dr. Soin, um, from, uh, we've got one from Anviksha for you. If I sign a do not resuscitate, can I still donate my organs? Um. 
generally speaking, no. But yes, in specific instances, you can donate your organs. So what can you donate? So when somebody says, do not resuscitate, and if such a person uh, dies a cardiac death, then they can donate corneas. If they are in a hospital situation, they can actually become uh, DCD donors, donation of the cardiac death. And that can be, if we are a young person, then yes, it can be liver, kidneys, lungs, heart. So under very specific circumstances, yes, but do not resuscitate is actually a bad idea if you want to be an organ donor. Because you know the problem is that you won't be able to give them special medicines, you won't be able to put them on ventilators and stuff, or even if they're already on ventilator, then you know you you will not be able to support them to keep their organs healthy. So right. generally not good. Okay. Um, Pallavi from Deepak, what happens if the death happens outside the hospital? Is it possible to recover the organs and use them? It is not possible to recover the organs because uh, organ donation in our case, as has you know, we, this, this term has come up many times. Brain in, happens only in the case of brain death, where the person is in the hospital on a ventilator in an ICU. So the person has died, but the organs are still getting perforated with the help of the of a ventilator. So it has to be in that control setting because in any other setting moment the heart stops functioning, the organs also die. You can only be a tissue donor. So cornea, skin, heart walls, other kind of tissues can be donated. But for solid organs, you have to be in this control setup in an ICU on a ventilator and brain dead. Got it. Okay, uh, Dr. Soin, are you still with us? We have a question. Um... I'm sure Dr. Atawa can take it as well. Okay. Pavla, he had a flight to catch, he had to leave. So. No problem. Dr. Atawa, can you help us? How does donating a part of the liver affect the life of the donor? Is it advisable? I think this is, this is a great question. As Dr. Swain did mention earlier, the liver has an amazing Swain quality and ability to regenerate itself. And that's why when, when liver surgeons or hepatologists decide on which segment and how much, it is a very carefully calibrated process where they are very sure that the tissue comes from a, from a healthy individual who does not have any comorbidities or premorbidities, has a great chance of liver recovery or regeneration over a period of time. So it's probably one of the only organs that can regenerate extensively post a donation. So no reason why uh, one should even hesitate to be a, a live liver donor in that, in that sense. Right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Tower And Dr. Swain, you've, you've joined us back. <laughs> so is it- Dr. Tower did a great job with <laughs> I saw Dr. Swain giving an approving look. <laughs> you passed the master. master. <laughs> if it hadn't been for living donor liver transplantation, liver transplantation would have never happened. Never happened. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because okay, even so today, 80% of the transplants are living donor transplants. Right. Um, for Pallavi, we've got a quick question from Shankar. What is conditional donation and directive donation? All right. So directive donation is when the donor family specifies that we are willing to donate organs, but one or maybe more than one of the organs should go to someone that they that they have decided, someone in the family or someone in the in their larger network. So they, they say we want that particular organ to go to this particular person. Now, there has been a lot of confusion around this in our country because the act, the law is silent. The, uh, the law is uh, not saying anything on it. So it becomes a little bit of an issue because uh, in, the, in, in, a, in the larger context, it said that organs do not belong to families or hospitals where the, where the donation, they belong to the society and there should be a fair and just and equitable distribution according to the waiting list. But here, the sentiments of the family also come into play. There is a lot of discussion. I, I think recently, Dr. Soin was also part of a debate um, in one of the newspapers. There, there, are, there are pros for it, there are cons for it. But uh, right now, it remains a gray area. And decisions are taken based on individual cases by individual state bodies. Thank you, Pallavi. And now uh, we've got our last question from the evening uh, for the evening. And this is addressed to Dr. Tower. I've had a heart lung transplant recently. Can I donate my organs? Probably other organs other than the heart and the lung, for sure. Right. May I make a quick comment here? This sure, question sure. comes up very often, Bhavna, every time we go out to, to do 
talks on organ donation and people keep saying, I have this condition, can I donate? Can I have this condition, can I donate? Mm -hmm. I would like each one of us to decide whether they want to be organ donors or not. At the time of death, wherever that is, five years down the lane, 10 years down the lane, 20 years, tomorrow, extensive tests will be done before the decision is taken to remove organs. And only those organs will be removed that are going to be used for recipe. And so let people just simply decide whether they want to be organ donors or not. And let the experts at the time decide whether those organs are suitable or not. You have been amazing, amazing. Dr. Soin, Dr. Atawar. Uh, Pallavi, thank you so much to our uh, donors and the donors family and the recipients and of course the entire uh, CII team. I'm, I'm truly grateful. I'm now going to um, hand over to my colleague Ms. Shibani Takral uh, and Shibani will please come and give the vote of thanks and formally close the evening. Thank you. Thank you Bhavna. I would firstly like to thank Mr. Baman Irani even though I know he's not here he had to leave but for coming forward and lending his wonderful voice and a part of his soul to a cause we at CII IWN feel so strongly about. Also a big thank you to Dr. Soyen. I'm not sure if he's still there. I know he had to catch a flight as well, but uh, Dr. Soyen needs a special mention because he's not only the leading liver transplant surgeon in the world, but an extremely, extremely fine human being. And I can say that from my own personal experience. Dr. Tower, the passion and commitment you have for what you do, I mean, it comes through so wonderfully in everything you've said today. Thank you for your amazing work. We are very fortunate to have you here today. Thank you. And a big thank you to Pallavi uh, Kumar for holding the torch and showing us the way forward uh, through an alley which is, which is truly riddled with myths, fears, challenges, and so many questions. So thank you for always being there and always a pleasure Shibani. Thank you. Pallu. Our wonderful donor families and recipients. Thank you for sharing your inspiring stories. Last but not the least, I would like to thank Bhavna, the chairperson of CII IWN for moderating this evening's discussion so beautifully. A big thank you to Zia and, and our vice chair for all her inputs in bringing this evening together and the fabulous team at CII IWN and the CII Delhi Secretariat. I hope each one of you will give a deep thought to what we have discussed here this evening. This cause is exceptionally close to my heart. Uh, my husband was blessed and fortunate to be a recipient of a liver through a wonderful and willing life donor. But not everyone is that fortunate. And the truth is, no one should really need to donate their organs during their lifetime to save a loved one. Uh, if we have enough deceased donor organs, you know, no one needs to share their organs. It, there's enough grief and anxiety in a family already, but if we have enough deceased organs to choose from, it just solves so much of the stress and problem and gives you a life. So for all of you who, who are here today, if this talk resonates with you, please do have an open conversation with your families tonight and express your will to donate. That's all you need to do because it is after all, live beyond and live forever. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us this Thank evening. You. The session is officially closed. <laughs>